Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, this is obviously the most unusual Easter for us. Uh, we're not able to meet together physically. We're not able to share communion together. Uh, but it is one of the good things that we can do over technology to spend time to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us. And over the Easter weekend, while we can't meet together, we still want to focus our attention on what Jesus has done for us. Um, today, we're going to look at why Jesus died on the cross. And on Sunday, we'll be considering the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And on Sunday evening, we're going to continue that thought as well and look at that over Zoom um, also but we are able to celebrate together Good Friday. It seems strange and odd to use the word good to describe what happened today. Jesus died, he endured an awful punishment and penalty for us. But the good news is that there is a victory in what Jesus did. When Jesus died at the end of his life, he uttered three words. He said, it is finished. There's this sense of declaration of victory over what he was doing. He was the one who came to save us, to die for us. And in his final breath, in his final moments, there is this sense of victory and overcoming and finally being proven true in his resurrection. We're going to look at that. We're going to consider why Jesus' death is perfect, why it is better than anything that we could do. Um, but before we do that, we're going to sing. We're, hopefully all will work okay with technology. Um, but we're going to try to sing 10,000 Reasons uh, we know this is a church we've sung it on a number of occasions. It'll hopefully come up on your screens with the lyrics and, and the music. So do follow along with us. Do sing at home. Even if you don't think you can sing well, still sing. Um, and it'll come up now, 10,000 Re Reasons by Matt Redman. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy draws 
me and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then If you've just joined us um, midway through the song and you're wondering who we are, um, my name's Johnny. I'm the pastor of the church here at Opney. Um, we're an evangelical Baptist church. We believe the Bible is God's word. We believe that it tells us um, how we are to live, how we are to behave, and how God expects the church to be run. But also we believe that the gospel is the central point of all history, that the good news of Jesus is not just part of a day in history, but actually defines everything that came before and everything that comes after. And what we're going to consider is a section in God's Word in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. And it's this section where the writer to the Hebrews um, builds a grand picture about Jesus. And the writer is, is um, writing to a church, to a group of believers that seem to be wavering in their faith they seem to be tempted to leave Jesus behind. And in Hebrews 10, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 10. Um, the words will hopefully come, on the, uh, come up on the screen. But if you have a Bible at home, it would be good for you to follow along, because when we come to look at this, we'll be going bit by bit. So if you can follow with me, that would be helpful. But Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to begin reading at verse 1, and we're going to end at verse 10. So Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sac sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We'll end our reading there at verse 10. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to spend some time looking at that section uh, that we just read. So let me pray. Father, we do ask that you grant us understanding, 
that you would help us to appreciate what your word says. And Father, we pray in your kindness that we would respond in faith to Jesus. May we trust him. May we love the Savior. And Father, may we know the freedom that comes from his death. Father, we thank you for what you have given us. We thank you that it is perfect. And we pray now that we would love that all the more. Amen. 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 So have your Bibles open to the section in, in Hebrews. And it is a, a wonderful and grand section. But when we read it, one of the things that seems slightly strange for us is it is against or denies our place in, a, in a either sorting or earning our salvation. When you read it, you get to see that God is the one who's at the forefront when it comes to the good news about Jesus. We like to put ourselves at the center of things. We like to put ourselves first. And often we try to feel or want to feel like we have earned what we are given. When it comes to our presence each year, we are generally okay to receive certain types of presents, but when they're unexpected or out of the blue, we sometimes feel that we need to do more to, to legitimize it and to earn it. So you think about birthday presents, we're generally okay with that because it's our birthday, that's fine, that's legitimate. But if somebody just came up to us and said, here's a present, I just feel like giving it to you, here you are, we would be tempted to say, well, let me do something to make up for that. Let me give you a present or let me legitimize what you've given me. And our temptation when it comes to the gospel is no different. When we read the Bible, when we read God's word, our natural slant is to say, well, well, let me make sure that I'm ready for this. Let me make sure that I'm okay. And let me make sure that God is ready to receive me because I'm good enough. But when we read this, we'll get to see that there is only one way for us to be saved. There aren't multiple ways. There aren't goodnesses that we can do that will help us. When you read this, the writer is telling us that there's only one possibility for us to be saved. And on Good Friday, as we celebrate what Jesus has done, we are celebrating a painful sacrifice. We are celebrating something that was costly and was, was significant because it was someone enduring something that we deserve to pay. So we're going to explain that and open that a bit more as we go along here. But the first thing I want us to see as we look at this is the bad news for us. There's good news in this, and and the good news far outweighs any bad news that comes here. But to begin with, there is a bit of bad news for us. And the bad news is this. We are unable to do anything to make ourselves right with God. Our sacrifices aren't enough. Our sacrifices are never going to be good enough for God, and our sacrifices and our giving will never make it right with between us and God. When you get to read this section, you'll see that the, the writer builds a picture to say, here is the old way of doing things, and the fact that that old way was in, in, un, unable to make people right. And the author builds it in this way. The first thing he points out is that the sacrifices in the Old Testament, all the practices of trying to get forgiveness of sins, were nothing more than shadows. He says in verse 1, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. And it seems a rather strange way to put it. Why does the author refer to this law or the old way of doing things as a shadow? And the point the author's making is that the Old Testament way of doing things were nothing more than signposts and signals to something else. And the language of shadow is something that comes from a substance. So you think for ourselves, when we have a light in front of us, there's a shadow that shines out or that forms behind us. And when we look at the shadow, the point of it is that we know that someone else is blocking the light that there's something else coming, there's something else greater. And this is a point that the writer's making, that there is one thing that is greater than every sacrifice because every sacrifice is just a pointer. It's just a signpost. And the point the author's making here is this. Every sacrifice you do has no point or is useless because it is merely a signpost to Jesus. 
and our good works and our continuous behaviors to try to make ourselves right with God is absolutely useless because none of them were intended to save us. The Old Testament way of doing things were there to point people to the coming Savior. And this is where the second part comes in. Not only are the sacrifices useless or inadequate because they are signposts, the second thing is that the sacrifices only remind us of our problems. The Old Testament sacrifices of doing things were just there to remind people of their problems. And you read this, you got to see um, about the sacrifices being a shadow, and it says, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year. And then it goes on and it says, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. And the point the author is saying is that you have to come back to this again and again and again. There's a routine. And all the routine did was to remind the people of the sins that they have committed and in some way to absolve them in some temporary sense of what they've done. But the problem is that their sin was still there. They might be able to go away from it and feel better about themselves. But after a year, the sins that they would accumulate would lead to greater and greater guilt. And then they get the next year and they have to go to the temple, they have to get their animal, they have to get the priest, and they have to ask for forgiveness for the sins that they have committed. And it is a useless and inadequate sacrifice because it doesn't deal with our issue. It doesn't deal with our problems, our sacrifices, and whatever we think we can give will not aid us or not help us because the only thing that they do is remind us that we have a greater problem. We have something that reminds us of our permanent guilt. The third thing as well is that the sacrifices are inadequate because they weren't human. And this is the part that is difficult and hard for us to reconcile. Our natural thought is, well, it should be that God would look at, over, overlook our sin and just say, well, I'll forgive you, it's fine. But when you read the section and read the book of Hebrews, the problem is that man sins. That we reject God, that we despise God's rule, and we don't want God to rule over us. And what we do in turn with that is we say, well, I want to be number one. And we sometimes think, well, God should just accept us. But when we read this, we get to see that there is an issue that we have. The sacrifices remind the people of God's holy nature, of God's inability to just overlook our sin. And the sacrifices were there to say something greater needs to come. The inadequacy was there because it was saying to people, look, something else is to come that is greater. And the animals can't do what this person does that we read about where it says, behold, I have come to do your will. The sacrifices that we can have or we can do, whatever it is, is never going to make us right with God. And the reason why this is important for Good Friday and for setting ourselves up now to consider the good news is this. We are unable to begin to reconcile our relationship to God by ourselves. When we read the Bible, our temptation is to say, if I just do more, I'll be fine. When we read the Bible and we see our sin and see our problem, our temptation is, let me just do something else to make ourselves right with God. We finished Lent. Um, some people uh, recognize that and, and will do different things over Lent. But often the purpose of it is, well, if I do this, God will accept me. And we try to read our Bible and say, well, if I read my Bible more, God will accept me. But when we read this section of Hebrews we get to see that none of those things are going to be any good for us. Because they don't deal with our issue, they don't solve our problem, they only confound it more. The Old Testament way of doing things, the Old Testament sacrifices, and the, the writer is writing to this church because they're tempted to return to it. The author saying to him, don't. Because they're merely just pointing you to Jesus, and for you to enjoy forgiveness, you need something greater. So the bad news is for us that we are unable to make ourselves right with God. Our sacrifices aren't good enough. But here's where the good news starts to come in. 
The good news is wonderful, and the author lifts our, picture, lifts our eyes to see something greater, something more wonderful than the Old Testament uh, continuous actions. The author raises our eyes to see that God has always had a sacrifice in mind. That it wasn't the case that these things were done by God, that God organized them, that God said for the people to do them, and then realized after a while, oh, these aren't working out, so let me come up with a different system. When we read this, we get to see God has always had one plan, one purpose, one intention for our salvation. God doesn't come up with multiple ways for us to be saved. God has always planned one thing. And when you read the book of Hebrews, it is Old Testament upon Old Testament explained and telling us all about Jesus. And all of them are there to say, look at the Old Testament. All of it is pointing forward to Jesus coming. And we get to see this in different things, but different ways. But in Genesis 3, the beginning point where it's explained and opened up, Eve is told that someone is going to come from her line, and that person is going to put to, put to death Satan. He is going to crush Satan's head, and he is going to do something that will undo the sin that Adam and Eve have started. And in Genesis 3, God points us forward to Jesus. And then you get into this section in, in Hebrews, where even more reminder comes of what Jesus has done for us. It says here that God, as it says in verse 5, hasn't desired the sacrifices and offerings. And it says, verse 6, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have no taken no pleasure. That none of them have been God's intention. They've only been there to point to something else. And the good news of Good Friday is that we get to see God's plan of salvation being worked out. On Good Friday, we get to see the sacrifice that God had always intended and always set up for us. We get to see the perfectness of what God had planned. Something that will deal with the issue that we have. Something that will deal with the problems of our sin. Something that won't just remind us of what we have going wrong with us or what, what our issues are but something that in one go is going to perfectly work out the forgiveness that we need. And in Good Friday, in some way, we look at Perfect Friday of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus dies on the cross as the perfect sacrifice, the one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, that we get to enjoy a forgiveness that, that, is, that is proven in Jesus' um, resurrection from the dead. And as I said earlier, this is the pinnacle and, and the main point of all of history. Paul in his writing says that, that at the fullness of time, Jesus came. Good Friday is the perfect plan that God had. And it seems painful and difficult for us to consider that because this is at the cost of someone's life. Someone stepping in our place to die for us. And this is where we get even more good news. Because not only is it good news that the sacrifice is even um, greater than what we could do, not only is it the sacrifice that God had planned, but when you read what the author says, we get to see that it is wonderful and beautiful, the good thing that we enjoy. And the good news is that Jesus' sacrifice is perfect. Jesus' sacrifice doesn't just flip the inadequacies of the Old Testament way of doing things on its head. It actually is more wonderful and more grand. It's more spectacular and beautiful. The first thing about it is that it is on our behalf. When Jesus dies, he steps into our stead and into our place. The sacrifices die um, in the Old Testament, but in no way do they really take the place of people. They, in some way, are just a picture to say, look, some sacrifice needs to come that is better. And the sacrifice that we need has to be someone like us, someone who can do for us what we cannot do ourselves. And you get to see that the way that it's written, this is a physical act. It says in verse 5 that there was a body prepared 
for Jesus. And then it says in verse 10 as well, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, where Jesus stepped in our place and willingly took the wrath and the penalty that we deserved. That he stood in our place and lived a perfect life in a way that we cannot live. And he is able to fulfill, as verse 9 says there, he has come to do the will of God. And the good thing about Good Friday is we get to see someone enduring something that we should do ourselves. He endures wrath, he endures anger, he endures everything so that we wouldn't have to go through it. And in the cross, we hear words that we will never have to say. In the cross, we have the the good news of Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we can know for a fact that we will never be forsaken by God. The good news that Jesus died on our behalf. The second thing as well that's good news is that Jesus' sacrifice is perfect because it happened once. How wonderful is this that, that it's not the continual action that was read about in the Old Testament. Such a difference where you read in verse 1 that the sacrifices are continually offered every year And then you get verse 10 at the very end of that statement where it says, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That the sacrifice didn't have to continue. That there was an action of Jesus dying once and that was enough. That there is a perfection to what Jesus has done for us. There is a perfection in what Jesus does in our place. But as well, Jesus does something that no other person in the Old Testament was able to do. The writer to the Hebrews elsewhere points out the fact that Jesus, when he dies, make make an atonement for us, he sits down. And in the Old Testament, no priest was able to sit down because the work was never finished. And here we have Jesus once dying for us, and that's it. No greater sacrifice that we can have, no greater sacrifice that we could do, no greater sacrifice that we could muster in ourselves would be anything close to this. This is the perfect sacrifice in our place. But the third part about the good news of Jesus' perfect um, sacrifice is that it gives as well full forgiveness. And this is one that we we may not always appreciate or may not always remember when we consider what Jesus has done for us. We may say, yes, Jesus' death is, is perfect. But then we creep back into what we are usually like and we start to feel that we need to do more to make ourselves right with God. And when you see what the writer says here, there is nothing we can do and we need to have that cemented into our heads so that we never lose sight and never forget this. We will never be able to make ourselves right with God. And the only way that we can enjoy full forgiveness is through Jesus. And you read the way that the writer refers to it here. Verse 10, it says, "Um, And by that will we have been sanctified. We are being made holy. We are being made right with God. The accusations that could be put against us are no longer legitimate. In verses 1 to 4, the, the sacrifices did nothing for us. As it says, the sacrifices didn't clean the people. It didn't stop them. But verse, verse 3, verse 2 rather, It says, otherwise, would the sacrifices not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. And we do often remember our sin, and we do often forget what Jesus has done for us. Jesus' forgiveness is perfect. The death that he died for us is perfect. Therefore, the sins that we commit are no longer able to be against us. It's not that Jesus died in part for us. It's not that the forgiveness that God offers us in Jesus is in part. It is perfect. It is fulfilled. It is final. And for us at Good Friday to remind ourselves that this is perfection worked out for us. Jesus dies in our place. Jesus dies in our stead. Jesus does something that we cannot do ourselves. 
And at Good Friday, we're able to look at the cross and we're able to rejoice and say, thank you for dying for me. So we have the good news of what Jesus has done. The bad news is we cannot do it ourselves. Our sacrifices, our greatest efforts, our greatest works are never good enough. We have a sacrifice that God has always intended, and this sacrifice is perfect. Let us remember that when it comes to Easter, Good Friday, and then we get to Easter Sunday, and we remind ourselves of the resurrection of Jesus. It is perfect. It is final. It is concluded. So let's rejoice in that. Let us love that. Let us excite ourselves in that. What we're going to do now is we're going to sing in response to that. We're going to sing, Who, O Lord, can save themselves? Again, the words will come up on the screen, and then the, the song is the music as well. So let's sing. save themselves their own soul could heal a shame was deeper than the sea your grace is deeper still who oh Lord could save
So that's our Good Friday service. Um, we hope you have a, a nice day at home. Um, but if you do want to contact us, um, if you have any questions or would like to know more about this gospel that we've been talking about, um, do get in touch. Uh, our website has been on the, the screen at different points, but it's Upney Baptist, U P N E Y Baptist. Um, org. uk. Um, please do get in touch. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. But let me pray for us as we conclude and finish. Father, we do thank you for the good news that we uh, we have in Jesus. We thank you that He has died the perfect death for us. We thank you that He is the perfect sacrifice, and we pray that you'd help us now. Give us grace and encouragement, Father. We pray that we would trust Jesus more. And may you be glorified through all that we do today. And Father, for us on Sunday, as we continue this, as we get to the, the, the next part where we get to see Jesus risen from the dead, may we rejoice all the more. Father, may we excite ourselves at this Easter time and what Jesus has done. But Father, as well, we pray that you give us grace. For those that don't know Jesus, we pray that you would bring faith to them. And may the Holy Spirit work in their hearts to draw them to Christ. And Father, may we celebrate this Easter, the newness, newness of life and those who are in Christ. And we pray this to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. i